Welcome to the third week of administrative law. Last week, we looked at two different constitutional restrictions on the legislative power. The first, the non-delegation doctrine, allows Congress to delegate legislative-like power to agencies only under statutes that state an intelligible principle. In practice, this limitation has proven to be easy to satisfy. The second constitutional restriction was announced in the Chada decision. When Congress acts legislatively to control, correct, or undo what an agency has done, Congress must observe the bicameralism and presentment clauses of Article I. This means that a legislative veto is unconstitutional. Our classroom discussion also led us to conclude that Congress cannot streamline the private bill mechanism by which sponsored aliens are granted legal residency. A private bill has to pass both houses of Congress in identical form and be presented to the President for signature. Congress still has various other means of controlling the agencies. It can repeal or amend the legislation that created the agency. It can attach so-called riders to the annual omnibus appropriations bill to forbid or require agency spending on particular enforcement or regulatory matters. Committees of either house can demand reports and hold hearings, requiring agency officials to listen to complaints, to answer questions, to give assurances, and sometimes to endure tongue lashing. We ease now from the subject of legislative control to executive control. We will need to distinguish three modes of control. The first is appointment. Picking a person to do a job is one way of determining how the job gets done. Is removal. Holding a person accountable for how a job is done typically involves the ability to fire that person. And finally, there's the matter of supervision. A job may be defined in ways that subject the job holder to close direction, or alternatively, the job may be defined to give the job holder leeway in deciding how the work gets done. You may have encountered the common law distinction between employee and independent contractor. One way of marking this distinction in private law is in terms of the degree of independence from supervision. An employee is typically subject to being told not only what to do, but how to do it. An independent contractor who takes on a job is typically expected to do it free of supervision. We start with the subject of appointment. Congress creates, defines, and funds the jobs to be done. But the chief executive, the president, has a role in choosing who fill, fills them. The president's exercise of the power to nominate officers is fraught with important consequences, good and bad. James Garfield, the 20th president, was assassinated by a disappointed office seeker. President Garfield is supposed to have said, every time I make an appointment, I create nine enemies and one ingrate. But Voltaire had long before attributed the quotation to Louis XIV of France. In any case, it is something that President Garfield might have said, and that President Thomas Jefferson did say, and that President William Howard Taft was fond of saying. The office of the President of the United States is defined in Article II of the Constitution. Section 1 vests the executive power in a president. The scope of this simple sentence has been controversial ever since Alexander Hamilton opined that this vesting clause is itself a source of implied powers. According to Hamilton and later unitary executive theorists, the further enumeration of specific presidential powers in Article 2 is merely illustrative rather than exhaustive of vast powers packed into Article II's vesting clause. 
Setting aside the President's role as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and as the nation's agent in conducting foreign affairs, the specific powers conferred on the President in Article II do not appear to be particularly robust. Section 2 states the President may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject. That would seem to go without saying. There is more to Section 2, which we will get to in a moment. Section 3 is important in defining the President's role in the governing of the United States. The President shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. The President shall. This is duty-imposing language, but some, not all of them unitary executive theorists, say that this clause is empowering as well. The President must have the powers necessary to see to it that the Constitution and the laws made by Congress and interpreted by the courts are faithfully executed. The President's role in appointments is stated in another clause of Article 2, Section 2. That clause provides that the President shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate officers of the United States. Strictly speaking, the President shall nominate rather than appoint. The Senate has to concur for it to be an appointment. Nevertheless, it is customary to, the, to refer to the President's appointment power. What if the Senate isn't in session to confirm an appointment? The framers provided for that. The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. So, if the Senate doesn't like any of the President's nominees, the President can at least make a so-called recess appointment. The concepts of power and duty are important for lawyers to be clear about. Both are sometimes referred to as rights, and that can lead to unnecessary confusion. Consider the following questions. Does Article 2 impose upon the President a duty to see that the laws are faithfully executed, or merely a power to do so? Failing to exercise a legal power is not in itself a legal wrong, but failure to perform a legal duty is almost the very definition of a legal wrong. Article 2 states that the President shall take care. This means that it is the President's duty to take care. Powers may be implied from this, insofar as necessary, to enable the President to do her duty. How about this? Does Article 2 impose upon the President a duty to nominate officers, or merely a power to do so? Well, clearly the President has the power. But does the President also have a duty to nominate officers? Article 2 says, shall nominate, not may nominate. Compare this question. Does Article 2 impose upon the President a duty to make recess appointments, or merely a power to do so? Must the President make recess appointments? No. Notice the difference in language. It is significant that Article 2, Section 2 says that the President shall nominate and Section 3 says shall take care, while the Recess Appointments Clause says instead that the President shall have power. Suppose this is significant. What if the President decides to leave offices vacant? Is that within the President's power? Or is the President's duty to fill offices created and funded by Congress implicit in his duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. Consider this. One year into his term, President Trump had failed to make nominations to 366 of 591 key offices. Why? The President apparently believes that he had no duty to make nominations, merely the power to do so, 
just as with recess vacancies. He also tweeted that it was his prerogative to reduce the size of government by declining to make nominations to fill offices of the United States. Some agencies are headed by multi-member commissions or boards. Many of these have quorum requirements that cannot be met when there are too many vacancies. As, for example, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board is dormant because four of its five board positions are vacant and it lacks a quorum. President Trump has not nominated anyone to fill its vacancies, at least not of, as of June of last year. We will return to the subject of the extent and nature of the President's powers vis-à-vis -vis Congress's powers. A case that tells us a lot about how the appointment process is supposed to work is Buckley v. Vallejo. Buckley was a challenge to the Federal Elections Act, as amended in the wake of the Watergate scandal that brought down President Nixon. The staff of CREEP, the Committee to Re-elect the President, suspected that there was damaging information to be found in the office of the Democratic National Committee in the Watergate. Creep hired burglars, paid for with campaign money. Congress believed that a slush fund of unaccounted for campaign money had tempted the administration to spend for opposition research outside the bounds of law. The amendments were meant to limit and to regulate the flow of money in politics and to make contributions and spending more transparent. The campaign finance statute was challenged by Senator James Buckley, who happened to be the brother of conservative columnist William F. Buckley, Jr. The relevant part of the Buckley opinion strikes down the composition of the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, on appointments clause grounds. The FEC had significant rulemaking and enforcement powers and could not be considered a mere repository and clearinghouse of information. It was composed of eight members, one member from each of the two major parties nominated by the president. A similar pair nominated by the president pro tempore of the Senate, also two by the Speaker of the House. In addition to the two voting members, the Secretary of State and the Clerk of, of the House of Representatives served ex officio, in addition to the six voting members. All but the ex officio members had to be confirmed by both House and Senate. Notice that there is an even number of voting members. By design, the FEC was unable to promulgate regulations that set back the interests of either of the two major parties. Also by design, third parties had no seat at the table. The Buckley Court found a constitutional defect in the manner of appointment to each of the eight positions. The president nominates only two of the eight commissioners, but even those two positions failed to satisfy Article II because the House had to confirm them. Article II only requires senatorial confirmation. The rest of the commission is clearly incompatible with the requirements of Article II unless the commissioners could be classified as inferior rather than principal officers. Inferior officers are accountable to a higher official than the president. Other than the president, principal officers are not. Article II provides, the president shall nominate by and with the advice and consent of the Senate officers of the United States, but the President, but the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such officers as they think proper in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. But the President pro tem of the Senate and the Speaker of the House are not heads of departments or courts. So none of the six voting members are appointed by a process allowed under Article II. And even the appointment of the ex officio members is thrown out in a later case. So Buckley is as good as a casebook hypothetical as an example of how not to make appointments. The framers showed foresight in giving Congress the power to streamline the appointment of inferior officers. The framers foresaw a day when the federal government, call it bureaucracy if you like, would swell to such a size that it would be impractical to expect the Senate 
meaningfully to advise and consent to the nomination of each and every officer of the United States. Today, the number of officers requiring Senate confirmation is about 600. Apart from cabinet-level officials, it is not easy to say which of these is a principal officer and which is an inferior office as to which Congress has not bothered to let go of its confirmation role. How many inferior officers are there? I have been unable to locate a number, and some say no exact number can be assigned. We do know that not all who work for the federal government are officers, principal or inferior. There is a category of employee, someone who does not exercise significant authority and who does not therefore have to be appointed by the president, a court, or a department head. Many of these employees are hired by officials lower down in an agency hierarchy. All told, there are about 2 million civilian federal employees, excluding the Postal Service. That's a lot of jobs. A lot of jobs that it would please an incoming president to be able to hand out to supporters. Here, President Chester A. Arthur is pictured handing out government jobs as favors. Obviously, he wants to create as few ingrates as possible. Every four years, just after the presidential election, a committee of the House or the Senate publishes a document called United States Government Policy and Supporting Positions, commonly known as the Plum Book. As of June 30, 2016, it listed about 9,000 federal civil service leadership and support positions in the executive branch that may be subject to non-competitive appointment. For example, such positions as agency heads and their immediate subordinates, policy executives and advisors, and aides who report to these officials. The duties of many involve advocacy of administration policies. But staffing the government exclusively with partisans is problematic. Congress addressed this by giving many categories of federal employees certain protections against dismissal. This is a subject we'll come back to. Congress has also created the competitive civil service. Many, but far from all, federal jobs are reserved to qualified applicants. You may or may not be pleased to know that administrative law judges, known as ALJs, have to pass exams to qualify for that job. In the recent Lucia case, reported in our casebook supplement, the U.S. Supreme Court held that the ALJs who work for the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, are officers, not mere employees. They preside over hearings, just as Article III judges do, and it does not matter whether their decisions are merely recommendatory. As officers, ALJs must therefore be appointed by the commission itself, i.e., the head of the department. President Trump has ordered all executive agencies to make sure their ALJs are properly appointed, in many cases by having the head ratify existing employees. And he has taken a further step. Reading Lucia as calling into doubt whether competitive examination and competitive service selection procedures are compatible with the discretion an agency head must possess under the Appointments Clause in selecting ALJs, President Trump, by executive order, has directed that ALJs henceforth be exempted from competitive examinations and ratings. Which may or may not please you to hear, whether or not you are thinking of someday becoming a federal ALJ. In our next installment, we look at the flip side of appointment, removal. <laughs>